Among my earliest memories are those of visiting my grandparents. I recall one visit when my cousins and I were riding bikes up and down the sidewalks in the neighborhood. It is a common childhood memory. I was riding an old tricycle an old tricycle kept in the garage for when grandchildren visit. I was not yet old enough for grown-up wheels. On this particular day, in this particular early memory that I have, the front wheel of this tricycle was very squeaky. you may already be able to guess where this is going. I rode that squeaky tricycle up the driveway and to the garage and explained to my grandfather that the wheel was quite noisy, something was the matter, and something had to be done about it. So my grandfather got out an old oil can, you know those old oil cans with the long, narrow spout? like that was needed for the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. My grandfather, he knelt down, my wide eyes peering over his shoulder to the tricycle. He tended to that squeak with that old oil can, saying to me, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. It was the first time I recall hearing that expression, that well-known idiom, good experiential education. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. If one is loud or noisy, that's where the attention goes. That's how the problem gets solved. I didn't understand it as a negative or a positive statement. It was a neutral statement. One speaks and one is heard. Squeaky wheel equals grease. If life were only so simple. If we only and always knew how best to advocate for ourselves and others, if things always turned out the way we wanted, we know, yes, that the squeaky wheel does not always get the grease. Oftentimes I feel it can be drowned out by a chorus of like the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want. And in fact, sometimes a squeaky wheel is just squeaky and some wheels never get a chance to even squeak. There is something more going on in the parable we heard earlier. A parable, a teaching story that is being heard in many churches this morning. Those words about the city, there was the widow who kept coming to the judge saying, Grant, me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out. There is something more to the story than a squeaky wheel getting grease. That expression just doesn't cut it. In the context in which that text would have been shared. The woman, due to her social status, her gender, would have typically been unheard. There would not have been space for her voice. It is also a story, an example of someone finding her voice and doing so with a passion for justice. The theme of finding 
One's voice is not new. The challenge of being heard is not new. It is all too human, both ancient and contemporary, both then and now. When I started making a list last week of stories of individuals finding their voices or struggling to be heard, it didn't take long for the page to fill. From parables, from teaching stories in the Bible of the first century of the common era, to fairy tales even, like Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. Remember that story? You might know it better from the Disney. Right? A sea witch proposes a deal to take the little mermaid's voice so she can become human. The little mermaid says, but if you take away my voice, what is left for me? Fast forward to another century. Carol Gilligan, in her book back in the early 1980s, the book In a Different Voice, brought to light some of the complexity of voice, of gender, of moral development of both boys and girls, of both men and women, and she writes this. Quote, to have a voice is to be human. To have something to say is to be a person. But speaking depends on listening and being heard. It is an intensely relational act. She continues, by voice I mean something like what people mean when they speak of the core of the self. Voice is natural and also cultural. End quote. Fast forward again to last year when a young girl from Pakistan named Malala was shot for speaking out on a girl's right to education. Her voice and story is once again filling the airways in recent days. Her voice saying, asking, why should I wait for someone else? Why don't I raise my voice? Why don't we speak up, she says. inspiring. One of the tasks, I believe, many people believe of education, of religious education, of religious literacy included, is to help one another find our voice. And often this task is accomplished by listening to others' voices. So here's a story. It's over 12 years ago now. It was the summer of 2001. I worked as an educator at a pilot program of an interfaith initiative in upstate New York where a group of teenagers gathered together for two weeks of interfaith dialogue and living together in community. The teens came from Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist religious traditions. They came from the US, from places like New York City and Denver, Colorado. They also came from South Africa, from Ireland, and the Middle East. They came from communities mired in histories of religious conflict. Perhaps you can imagine the sound of their voices. They're mostly tweens and teens. That time when, for some of the boys, their voices were literally changing. And where, for some of the girls, that trajectory that sometimes happens right about that age when they start to shrink, start to lose their voice. And they were not only from different religious traditions, but there was a multitude of accents, of inflections, everything needing translation, even as we dialogued in English. And of course, they had the voices of their religious upbringing, as well as their own developing questions and experiences, coming into contact, into encounter, into meeting with voices very different 
from what they were accustomed. So our goal, our intention for gathering in that group was of course to bring forth peaceful and positive community that accepts and celebrates the differences between traditions. We made all sorts of mistakes myself included, trying to learn how to talk with one another. It wasn't always easy trying to figure out how to organize a rustic camp kitchen to serve numerous religious dietary guidelines or to organize schedules around worship times, how to pray together before a shared meal. It was meaningful and at times a quite complicated experiment. (laughs) 